This is your one minute warning. Please be making your way to the auditorium or make your way back from your kitchen to your computer or device if you're virtually tuned in. When we get a quorum, we're going to open in prayer. Now, I want my children especially to pay attention how quickly this group settled down and was quiet. <laughs> There's much to be learned here in Tavistock, so let's look to God in prayer again. Our holy God and Father, we're thankful for thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only hope for this world, the only hope any of us has, and we're glad that some of us can say, he's my hope, he's mine. And I'm his. We belong to him because he's purchased us with his own blood. We think of that great cost that our Lord died to save us. And we thank thee that he's risen again and that he'll never again have to suffer the cross. He'll never again have to lay down his life in sacrifice. Done is the work that saves. One sin forever done. Finish the righteousness that clothed the unrighteous one. We pray as we look into God's word that we would do so with open hearts and minds to hear thy voice speaking to us and not only to take it into our mind, but to live by it, to let it sink into our hearts and to obey the word of God. That we would first of all obey the command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so that we might be saved if we never have before. And that if we are saved, that we would walk in a way that pleases thee as we depend on thee day by day and let thy spirit work in our lives through the word of God. We pray this in the Lord Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now we're back in Daniel 3, and just as last night we noted there's connections in the book of Daniel, that chapter 2 is connected to chapter 7. Sorry, pointing that the wrong way. Good thing this laser's not powerful or I'd have a hole in my stomach. Uh, We noticed last night that what we see here depicted in the dream image that image with the head of gold and then the silver and bronze and iron and iron mixed with clay with the stone corresponds over here to chapter 7 where you get those same four empires depicted but the other side of the coin or as a radio personality down our way used to say you get the rest of the story. You get the fact that sometimes governments aren't nice. Sometimes they can act in a very powerful way threatening way, especially when they think that their own hegemony, their own needs are threatened. And you find out in chapter 7, eventually, there's going to come a world ruler who demands complete allegiance and who seeks to stamp out the worship of the true and living God. And that points forward to the events of the tribulation, which Revelation 13 through 19 especially is going to more clearly spell out to us, especially chapter 13 of Revelation. And just like that correspondence, when we look at chapter 3 and this image they're being called to worship, there's going to be some things in chapter 8 that correspond to that. So we'll be heading there in in a little while, but first we look at what happened with these young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now there are always people watching, of course. There are always people that want to see what someone who claims to believe in God, especially the God of the Bible, someone who says they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, the world is watching. People want to know what we're going to do. And the stakes were pretty high. They came and told Nebuchadnezzar, you know, out of all these luminaries, these big important folk, the muckety-mucks, as we might say, uh, there are three, these captives of the Judeans, And you'd be thinking that they'd be thankful that they could come into a great nation like Babylon and participate in our government and all of that. But they're not bowing down to the image. And when Nebuchadnezzar heard that, he got quite angry. So we break in at Daniel chapter 3 and verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound, and he enumerates all the different instruments, if you're ready when you hear all kinds of music and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Well, a question was put forth in chapter 2 about what the answer was. And of course, the wise men said, there's no human being that can answer the king's matter. The answer is with the gods whose dwelling isn't of flesh. And here again, another challenge is thrown out, God word. The question is, who's the God that can deliver you out of my hands? Now, at least seven times in this chapter, you get that phrase, the fiery furnace. So it looms large in the narrative. We know what the stakes are. Bow, toe the line, in other words, go along with everybody else, and your life goes on well, unmolested. You can continue on your merry way, enjoying the spoils and the good things of Babylon. Go the other way, though. Refuse to bow, and really you're flouting the authority of Nebuchadnezzar the king and his government and everything it stands for. You're saying that there's someone higher than Nebuchadnezzar. There's a higher throne, a higher authority. And if you try that, you're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And look at how their answer comes. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, basically what they were saying is, we have every confidence in our God. We believe that our God is able to deliver us. There's no doubt in our minds that our God is great enough, that he has the power to deliver us from this burning, fiery furnace. We believe God. But if not, that is, if God decides he doesn't want to deliver us. If God wants us to die instead, you know that's not the worst thing that can happen? Because to deny the Lord, to deny our God, that would be the worst thing that would happen. We don't want to live that way. We want to be loyal to our God in life. And if it comes to that, if it be his will, we want to be loyal to God in death. Well, I'll tell you, friends, that on New Testament ground, believers today are called to the absolute same standard of loyalty. Now, God said to the church in Smyrna, for example, in Revelation chapter 2, Be thou faithful unto death, and I shall give you the crown of life. The only one of two places in the Bible where the crown of life, that particular title, is mentioned. The other being in James 1. And they both, both occurrences, have the thought of passing the test. You see, we can say we're a believer in Christ, but the test will come. Does my confession have reality? Do I really know God? When the chips are down, is my faith really in Him? And am I willing to die if that be the Lord's will? Or would I deny the Lord to save my life? You know, the Bible points to a time coming in the future, the tribulation period, Bible students often refer to it as, because our Lord Jesus said that's a time of great tribulation, such as has never been on the earth. And the Bible shows us a time in Revelation 13, when unless you take the mark of the beast, you will not be able to buy or sell. Now already, so much of our purchasing happens in a cashless way, at least for my family, I don't know about you. But so often we're ordering things online or we're using a credit card or we're doing some kind of virtual payment. I don't necessarily handle paper money that frequently. 
and yet I buy things and pay for things just about every day. Can you imagine if the world is in a situation where commerce is so tightly controlled that you don't have the means of buying nor selling through some kind of technology, maybe that exists now that we have now, or maybe something that shall be invented before then, I cannot say. But the basic standard will be, if you don't bow to our way of thinking, to our God, to what we worship, to what we think is of utmost value in the world, well, you won't live anymore. If we can, we'll behead some of you. And if you run away, well, you won't be able to buy in normal channels. You'll have to run and hide and be refugees and be in all kinds of terrible situations. Now, through church history, that has happened to pockets of believers here and there around the world. And tonight, it's happening in certain countries. Tonight, some of our brothers and sisters in Christ are facing these very issues. And there are people I know in Canada and the United States, people I know personally, that have been held back in their jobs, in some cases, been unjustly fired from their jobs, or are not being properly remunerated in their jobs because of the stand they take for the Lord. So I'm not telling you this is something that's not already here. It is here. It already happens. But the difference is, in the future, it's going to be global. It's going to be worldwide. It's going to affect everything. And then, more than ever, we're going to see the force of the first temptation that came to the Lord Jesus, as recorded by the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, when Satan said to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones be turned into bread. And how did the Lord Jesus respond to that temptation? He quoted Deuteronomy, of course, chapter 8, and he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And of course, Deuteronomy is high on our list of our favorite books, I know. So right away, our mind goes to the context of Deuteronomy 8. And we say, yes, in Deuteronomy 8, that was when Moses was reminding them how in the wilderness, their shoes didn't wear out and their clothes didn't wear out. And when they were hungry, God gave them food. In fact, they didn't know what it was. They called it manna. We say manna in English. But manna means what is it? So they had no idea what they were eating. I've been in a few countries where that happened to me. But on a day-by-day -day basis for nearly four decades, they were eating something that kept them alive, that had all the proper nutrition, and yet they had no idea what it was. And it came to them by the verbal fiat of God. In other words, God spoke the word and they had their food. And the Lord Jesus said, there's something more fundamental, you know, than getting your food to eat and live. More fundamental than that is submitting yourself to God and saying, Father, give me what I need to live. And if in my loyalty to you, if in being faithful to you and worshiping you, Father, means that I should die in the course of your pathway, thy will be done. Some years later, when they came to arrest the Lord Jesus, and the disciples wanted to fight so he wouldn't be taken, especially Peter, who drew the sword. And the Lord Jesus said to him, The cup that my Father has given me, shall I not drink it? See, now it's my Father's time that I should go to the cross and die. And I'm willing to die, because that's what needs to happen to accomplish the will of my Father. That's what needs to happen to save people, to bring them to God, to make them sons of God, and give them eternal life. And it can happen no other way. So I'm willing to die. If I live, I live unto the Lord. And if I die, I die unto the Lord. And every believer really has to come and say the same thing. Lord, if it means that in order to live, this world tells me I've got to bow down to their gods and worship what they say and do what they do. Sorry, Lord, I'd just rather you take me to heaven. Take the world, but give me Jesus. All its joys are but a name. That's really the decision. They said, we're not going to bow down. 
So Nebuchadnezzar, verse 19 says, was full of fury and the expression of his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he command, spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. Now for sake of time, they took some of their toughest soldiers, some of the commandos, came and tied these men up and carried them to the furnace. And it was so hot that when they threw them down into the furnace they themselves died from the blast of heat that came forth from the opening. That's how hot it was. So it wasn't like they got thrown into a furnace that really there wasn't very much fire or this was just exaggeration and hyperbole and there wasn't much. No, the guards who threw them in died. They died from that heat. What happened to the three men in the fire? Well, Nebuchadnezzar, as I told you last night, was a very intelligent man. And doubtless in the course of his youth, he had to learn advanced mathematics in Babylon. I'm happy as a history major because we're not known for our prowess in mathematics. Some are, are, are good at it, but they're, they tend to be the exceptions rather than the rules in my experience. Most of us history people, we don't like math very much, but this is math for history majors. King Nebuchadnezzar looked at that fiery furnace and he called one of his advisors over and said, <clears throat> excuse me, um, didn't we cast three men into the fiery furnace? And yet I see four in the furnace walking around. Walking around? I mean, the guards just dropped dead getting near the opening of the furnace. And here are Four men, I don't know where that fourth one came from, but they're walking around? Yes, because when they brought forth Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. Now, tonight in Tavistock, I can't guarantee that for you. If you're going to walk outside at any length of time, you may smell a little smoky. I don't know if it's coming from northeastern Ontario or Quebec or where, but, you know, there's wildfires and smoke is coming across over here. And you don't have to be very far away from smoke until you start to smell smoky. And yet they came out unsinged and they didn't smell smoky. And as Nebuchadnezzar noted, the fourth, he's like the son of the gods or the son of God. He's like some divine being. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't have a Bible college degree or, or a theology degree, but he could see this fellow was different from them. And obviously, it was a representation of their God. They said, our God is able to deliver us. Did he deliver them from being thrown into the furnace? No. He delivered them through the furnace. You say, what's that mean? Well, what did the furnace do to them? it burned off their restraints. You know, there are a lot of believers that have given their lives for the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and that God has raised him up and made him Lord and Christ. That he's going to come again and rule as king of kings. That he's the only hope of mankind. That there's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. Many have died for that. Most of the apostles did. And yet, what really happened to them? What did the world take to them? When the Romans said, as they said to first century believers, once a year, you've got to offer a sacrifice to the emperor as if the emperor is a god. The other days of the year, worship whatever you want. But once a year, you've got to worship Caesar. And Christians said, we can't do that. We will be loyal to the Lord. We will be faithful. And some of them were killed. What did the world really take away from them? Well, you know something? You entered the world the same way I did. You didn't bring anything with you. I've never yet been to a maternity ward and seen a little bassinet with a U-Haul trailer attached to it. And as you've probably heard many a preacher say, you've never been to a funeral and seen a U-Haul trailer attached to the hearse, have you? I mean, the Bible says that we brought nothing into this world and it certain will carry nothing out. What is the world taken from the believer who dies knowing Christ, not dies knowing the Lord. All that's been taken from us is what holds us back from full, unfettered enjoyment and communion with the Lord. And when I die or when the Lord comes, that's what I'm going to have. 
access to the Lord with no distraction, like Robert Murray McShane said in his great hymn, I will stand before thee and see thee as thou art. I will love thee with unsinning heart. Not till then, Lord, will I fully know how much to thee I fully owe. Now they were brought out of the furnace. They were found to be unharmed. The fourth man disappeared. And he walked with them through every step of that process. All through the fires, he was with them. And he told Israel the same thing in Isaiah. When you go through the fires and when you go through the waters, I will be with you. And the Lord says it in the church age to us, doesn't he? He says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says to us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And the Lord promises to be with us. So no one's ever died in a jail cell for the Lord Jesus. No one ever has been burnt at a stake or shot in the head or stabbed or beaten or any other ways that believers have been killed down through the ages. They've never done that without the Lord Jesus being right with them. And when they die, when they expire, when their breath leaves them and their soul and spirit leave this world, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, absent from the body, present with the Lord. They don't know one moment's separation from the Lord. And one day the Lord will come and raise their bodies. And if you know the Lord Jesus, your body as well, and will transform us to be in glorious bodies like his body. Now again, they were promoted. And again, Nebuchadnezzar had to give homage to their God and actually issued an edict that nobody should speak against their God. So you talk about an amazing turnabout from demanding the worship of his idol and forbidding loyalty to God to turning around and saying, now don't let anybody speak against their God. He's the true God. That's quite a change. And yet Nebuchadnezzar still wasn't saved at that point. It will await tomorrow night for the story of how he came to know the Lord in my reading of it at least. But when we come over here to the parallel section in chapter 8, we get a look at something future. Now, as I said last night, chapter 7 gives us... Sorry, let me get it again. Boy, my aim is terrible tonight. Where's my laser going? There it is. Okay. Chapter 7, we've got these four animals representing the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And at the end of chapter 7, it looks really to the end of human government, to the end of the times of the Gentiles that are still future. The times when that man of sin called in Revelation 13, the beast who comes out of the sea and called in 2 Thessalonians 2, the man of sin, called in 1 John, the Antichrist. This man is going to come forth And he's going to speak great words against the Lord. And he's going to fight against the Most High. And of course, the Lord's going to put him down in judgment. Now, when we go to chapter 8, we don't really have time to get into chapter 8 in any kind of detail. But we find out that another vision of beasts comes. This time, not four of them, only two of them. And you find out the focus now is not on Babylon through Rome. But the focus is going to be on Kingdom number two, Medo-Persia, and kingdom number three, Greece. And represented by a ram, that's Medo-Persia, and a he-goat, that's Greece, there's going to be this great battle, and Greece is going to prevail. Especially because that he-goat representing Greece has one big horn. Now, you may have heard of him. He was a fellow by the name of Alexander the Great. And I'm not sure, but I think he was even famous before Colin Farrell played him in the movies. But, uh, yeah, he was, in fact. But, you know, that this is more than two centuries on from the time Daniel's living in. And yet God is giving a vision of what's going to happen two centuries down the line when Greece beats Medo-Persia. Now, the interesting thing is that out of Alexander's kingdom, he doesn't last very long. He only gets his power and his working for about 12 years of conquering. And he's mostly on the move, conquering countries. But when he dies, four of his generals take over the kingdom. And they're represented in Daniel chapter 8 by four horns. And 
particularly out of one of those horns, there arises one particular one. Now let's break into Daniel 8 at this point and let us uh, read at verse 10. Daniel 8 and verse 10. And it grew up to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression, an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices, and he cast truth down to the ground, and he did all this and prospered. Now what happens? Well, the same sort of thing we've seen in chapter 3. The kingdom says, you're not going to worship anything but what we tell you to worship. And this ruler in Daniel chapter 8 says, you're not going to offer the daily sacrifices. Now this goes back to the second book of the Bible, Exodus, that God told them they would have a continual burnt offering. Every morning and every evening, they would offer a lamb as a burnt offering. And that never stopped burning on the altar. All the other free will offerings, the voluntary offerings that people brought were offered on top of those. But the fire was always burning on that brazen altar outside the tabernacle and still later in the temple, it was the same. Representing the need for some sort of continual sacrifice to satisfy the holy and righteous God. Now this ruler in Daniel chapter 8 tries to stop that daily sacrifice and tries to stamp out the worship of the true God. Now certain things he does remind us of what the little horn in chapter 7 does. This one who speaks pompous words against the Most High, who arrogantly stands against the truth and tries to destroy the worship of God. But really, when you get into the nitty-gritty of the vision in chapter 8, you find out we're not talking about that figure because he comes out of the fourth empire, Rome which as we said last night, is going to be revived in the last days as a global empire. It's known under the term Rome at least. But in chapter eight, this one is coming out of Greece. Now, what gives, we might ask? Well, I'm indebted to David Gooding and John Lennox and their respective works on Daniel, who say that chapter eight is like a lens to look through future events And it's looking at the more near future of Daniel's time so that we can understand some things about the far future. Now, I used to have a map when I was growing up, and it had just the shape of the continents. And over the map, there was a plastic overlay that you could put. And when you put the plastic overlay over it, it would give you the different borders of the various countries. So if I took away the overlay, I saw the shape of North America, the shape of South America, the shape of Asia, and so forth. If I put down the plastic overlay, then I could see, oh, there's Canada and her border, there's the United States, there's Mexico, and so forth. I could see different details that were given. Now, in a way, chapter 8 is like an overlay that's saying this is what it looks like. When a believer has to decide, am I going to be loyal to God? And even though I might be killed for it, I'm going to say, no, I'm going to stick to the worship of the true and living God. I'm going to follow what his word says, even though it gets me killed. Or am I going to capitulate and go along with the course of this world? Am I going to be like the majority? Well, chapter 8 really is looking ahead to 167 BC, more or less. When we get a ruler, by then they're known as the Seleucids. They're descended from Seleucus, one of those four generals of Alexander the Great I mentioned. And this particular ruler, Antiochus IV, who people called, or he called himself Epiphanes, that means like God manifest in the flesh. Other people called him Eumenes, which means basically he's a loony. And I don't mean the currency, I mean he's nuts. Uh, He said, I'm God. You're going to worship what I tell you to worship. And he actually went into the temple and sacrificed a pig on the altar and erected an altar to 
one of the Greek gods and told the Jews that if they circumcised their babies, the male babies, that they would be tied around their mother's necks and be thrown off cliffs, and that if they tried to offer the sacrifices, they would be murdered, and so forth and so on. And so that brought about the Maccabean War. You may have heard of the books of First and Second Maccabees. They are not part of inspired scripture. They are not part of the word of God, but they are ancient works that tell us about that time period when the Jewish religion and the people of Israel at that time were under attack and were greatly persecuted for their loyalty to the Lord. Now in the end, chapter eight tells us that that man is cut off without hands. He died without human intervention. He wasn't killed in battle. History tells us he had some kind of seizure or something when he was on campaign, I think up in Syria somewhere, and he died. So he only was around for a very short period of time, six or seven years, something like that, and the Lord took him off the scene. And the Jews were able to carry on their worship in the temple right into the times of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when we look at what happened with that time period with Antiochus Epiphanes, certain aspects of it are like what's going to happen at the time of the end. When the man of sin comes, he's going to try to do something similar. He's going to say, I'm God, and he's going to set himself up in a temple on the Temple Mount, presumably, and demand that everybody worship him as God. So it's a case of history repeating because the devil's not very original, and people keep falling for the same old lies. But the point for the believer is this. We must be faithful unto death. We must be loyal to the Lord, even though it costs us, even though we're persecuted for it. In fact, the Bible promises it. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all who will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But you know, whatever persecution we face, we know this much. The Lord Jesus is the overcomer. The Lord Jesus was persecuted, persecuted unto death. But was that the end of the Lord Jesus? No. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. In every believer standing with the Lord, we will be raised and stand with him in glory. So we say, what can man do unto me? I trust in the Lord. And that's really the focus we have to have. 